Uh, first of all, uh, welcome to San Francisco. I hope you get a chance to uh, see some of the city in the Bay Area. Uh, it is a <clears throat> pleasure to uh, uh, speak with you this morning about a topic that uh, we've been pursuing for about 15 years, and that's looking at the metabolic characteristics of the living knee, rather than emphasizing the structural characteristics that has been the essence of my profession for decades. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the prevention, not the treatment, the prevention of osteoarthritis of the knee following a meniscal and ACL surgery. And we found that this is possible if we achieve and maintain joint homeostasis. And uh, that's going to be what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, the development of early knee arthritis following a meniscal uh, uh, or ACL injury and surgery is extremely common. Here's an example of um, somebody who had a partial meniscectomy and developed arthritis in the medial compartment, an ACL reconstruction and arthritis in the medial compartment. Um, and therefore, the human knee, in my opinion, is an excellent model for post-traumatic osteoarthritis of the knee. Now, for example, the rate of early arthritis following ACL reconstruction in the world's literature is an astounding 50% at 10 years, and it's an embarrassing statistic and a very disturbing one. And um, this is an example of what I'm talking about. This is an example out of my own practice. Uh, this is a pre-op x-ray in this gentleman at 23. He had a soccer injury, ACL rupture. This was done elsewhere. He had an ACL reconstruction with a bone tendon bone. He had an accelerated rehab program, which I think is antibiological and uh, qu quite a uh, 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 a wrong thing to do in my opinion, but it's popular currently. The patient was told he was fixed uh, and okay to return to pivoting sports at four months. This is part of our mantra is to return a patient to sport as soon as possible, again, which is anti-biological in my opinion <clears throat> and is dangerous. And this patient returned to sport at four months. He had recurrent soreness and mild effusions, which was dismissed, and he continued to play. The first time I found him uh, or saw him was at nine years post-op. And this is his x-ray. From here to here, advanced arthritic damage in his medial compartment with this bone scan showing this process is active. This is a disaster. And he's only 32. We don't have really good options for him. Um, <clears throat> now, the early reports of uh, the double bundle uh, uh, technique uh, that was mentioned earlier today, developed by Freddie Fu of Pittsburgh, uh, supposedly is going to solve this problem, has not solved the problem. Uh, the problem is not solved by a structural approach, and this shows no diminishment in rates of early arthritis with this technique. Now, the problem, in my opinion, is a belief in a pure structural and biomechanical paradigm of joint function. The assumption is Restore measurable structural and biomechanical characteristics, and you've restored knee function. This has been the basis in orthopedics for decades. But there's a different emerging orthopedic and musculoskeletal paradigm that views joints as living, metabolically active systems of billions of cells where each tissue or volumes of cells has its own normal metabolic characteristics. The term we use is tissue homeostasis. Now, this is the complex biochemical and metabolic processes that characterize volumes of living cells. Now, this is best imaged in bone with a standard technesium bone scan, and uh, which you'll be seeing over and over in my presentation today. And, but it's also true in any soft tissue that you look for, such as synovium, as you see here. Now, the loss of tissue homeostasis are things we're familiar with, such as the initial phases of a stress fracture, disuse muscle atrophy, ligament strain, synovitis. These are all examples of that. Here's a PET scan uh, in an ACL deficient knee showing this loss of homeostasis in high resolution in bone. Now, the fundamental principle of orthopedic treatment from a tissue homeostasis paradigm is to restore joint homeostasis rather than put the emphasis on restoring normal structural and biomechanical characteristics. Now, this what came to us b way back in 1982 when I was at Letterman Army Medical Center in San Francisco where I did <clears throat> my residency. And this is what we found looking at patients with patellofemoral pain syndrome. And what we found were patients that have a positive bone scan in the patella at a time when they had patellofemoral pain, and when, which resolved to normalcy on a normal bone scan after four months of cons successful conservative treatment. 
something changed metabolically to normalcy in these patients from patellofemoral pain to resolve, uh, resolution of pain. So we were on to something here. Now the same process has been now confirmed by Stanford Radiology a few miles south from where we are now with high resolution PET CT. And the, the, you, can, you can see this at higher resolution, the same process. I don't think this is gonna become clinically viable because the radiation exposure is six times higher with a PET CT and it's much more expensive. So the technetium bone scan I still think will be the standard of use to find this process. Now back, back in the 1984, we biopsy proved what this process was. It's not infection, it's not tumor, it's increased remodeling of bone or standard loss of osseous homeostasis. Here's homeostasis, here's loss of homeostasis. Uh, we became very comfortable with this. Now tomorrow, I'm gonna be presenting a workshop on this topic of etiology and safe treatment of patellofemoral pain tomorrow at about 1.30. So I will go over this in much more detail tomorrow. Now, advanced knee arthrosis is always associated with loss of tissue homeostasis. Those of you who treat uh, uh, <clears throat> arthritic knees know that the bone scan looks like this. You know it so much you don't even bother to get a bone scan, but this is known in our field. Uh, but not many people know that the same loss of osseous homeostasis occurs in patients with normal x-rays and in patients with normal MRI bone signal in a patient with a torn medial meniscus. And this is a point I want to emphasize here with you this morning, that loss of osseous homeostasis can occur readily in the presence of normal structural imaging data, normal uh, x-ray, in other words, kelgren at zero, and even normal MRI bone signal. Now, uh, we reported the uh, results of this in a group of patients with medial meniscus tears in Rio back in 2011, and 79 adults, uh, an astounding 97% of these patients, all of them had normal <coughs> radiographs, in other words, kelgren at zero, had positive bone scans in the face of normal x-rays. So it's a part of the, the um, clinical findings of a patient with a symptomatic medial meniscus tear that there is loss of osseous homeostasis going on in that patient, that if you don't get a bone scan and all you get is an uh, MRI, which most uh, orthopedic surgeons only get and radiologists only read, that you will not know this loss of homeostasis is occurring. Now, what we found was, when we tracked this out, is that this loss of homeostasis can resolve to normalcy, just like the patellofemoral pain cases, and without the development of osteoarthrosis. And so this is an important factor that we've, we found. Now, it just so happens that I tore my own medial meniscus in 2009, four years ago. These are my own images. This is my own bone scan. This is my actual MRI. This is my actual torn meniscus at surgery. And so I'm an example of exactly my own theories here. It just turns out karmically to happen in me. And uh, so you can see a loss of homeostasis here in my proximal medial tibial plateau. Notice that my MRI signal is normal. My x-ray is normal. Here's my torn meniscus. Now, 20 months later, my bone scan returned to normalcy at a time when my symptoms resolved completely. I stand in front of you this morning with a, with a total clinical silence having been achieved and maintained in my own knee. I can't tell which knee had the surgery. That's how good. I am totally asymptomatic. Despite the fact I am not structurally normal. I am metabolically normal, but I have achieved this in the face of structural abnormality. Now, as was indicated, I had both of my knees arthroscope without anesthesia to come up with a neurosensory map of the knee. Here's an example of that mapping. Uh, I wanted to know if you pushed on these very structures, would you feel it or not? The most important thing we found from this was that I had uh, grade three, and still have obviously, grade three chondromalacia of both my patellae. Here's a probe up into my right patella in 1998. Without anesthesia, gentlemen and ladies, I felt no pain at all. But I had a concurrent normal bone scan at the time proving osseous homeostasis and how important the bone metabolic activity is. So uh, here's an example of uh, advanced chondromalacic damage that has been totally asymptomatic in my knee for 14 years. And I'm not a small, you know, 98-pound Filipino lady. Uh, I'm a pretty heavy-set guy, and I'm 65 years old. And also, notice this. Those of you who are interested in, in, <clears throat> in arthritis research know that the T1 row MRI sequence is the hot topic now in MRI imaging, with, but it shows uh, proteoglycan content. Well, I decided to get a T1 row a couple years ago. Uh, blue is normal, uh, red is abnormal. Oh, well, I've got a horribly abnormal T1 row MRI. 
but uh, that doesn't mean anything because I have achieved tissue homeostasis in the face of this. So T1 rho being abnormal does not indicate that I'm going to hell in a handbasket. Now, about uh, in May of this year, I developed pain in my carpal metacarpal joint of my non-dominant thumb, and I felt, gee, maybe that's going to, uh, is abnormally metabolically active too. And so I had a chance to get a bone scan, and here, in fact, I predicted a hot bone scan there. This same process occurs in any joint, and we've proven this in other joints as well. But this is my own uh, bone scan in May of my wrist. It gave me a chance to re-bone scan my knees. This is my seventh bone scan in my life, by the way. And here, it's proven that I've maintained joint homeostasis in my left knee despite these structural characteristics in the face of persistent structural abnormality. Now, <clears throat> uh, persistent loss of bone homeostasis, by the way, precedes structural failure. What if your bone scan doesn't get better and gets worse? Look at this. This is the positive bone scan that, that got worse instead of better. It predicted this overt failure of osteoarthritis. It went from normal x-ray to advanced arthritis in a short period of time. The bone scan got worse. Now, <clears throat> In chronic ACL injured knees, the medial compartment is where the arthritis occurs, even though the initial injury is in the lateral compartment. Chronically, it's the medial compartment that pays the price, and here's a PET scan that backs that up as well. And so we track these out too. Here's a pre-op patient with a chronic ACL deficient knee. We did an ACL reconstructive surgery. 18 months later, we achieved tissue homeostasis here as well, proven with a normal bone scan. And, uh, Here's another patient with a positive bone scan in the medial compartment. At four months postoperatively, we rebone scan him. Look, the bone scan's worse. And it shows at four months that the knee has uh, been stressed metabolically. In fact, the knee doesn't know the difference between major surgery and an ax attack. And, and if you put a patient back at four months, this is a terrible time to put somebody back to sport because metabolically, it's not ready for it. It hasn't healed. But this same patient at 21 months has achieved full homeostasis proven by a normal bone scan. Now this is the same patient now, the same patient at 13 years. Notice, normal bone scan, no arthritis on the x-ray. kellgren lawrence zero. We've prevented arthritis in this particular case. Now this is case one in the ACL deficient knee. Now I'm going to show you an example of uh, some other cases here. Now this is case two. This is the 39-year-old male, 12 years out. Again, this is in the face of 50% arthritis in the world's literature. Uh, Kelgren lawrence zero, normal bone scan. Uh, this is a patient I did bilateral ACL reconstructions on. Kelgren lawrence zero, both knees, bilateral, normal bone scans. Here's a patient that had an ACL injury, put off surgery, another uh, injury. Now we did surgery. This is three years out, normal bone scan. Six years out, normal bone scan, kellgren lawrence zero. So the point is, restoration of tissue homeostasis, joint homeostasis trumps the structural damage and abnormality. Now, if the bone scan doesn't come to full homeostasis, such as in this case, it goes along with a patient that has abnormal damage and early arthritis. So, now there, we found that there are three criteria for long-term success from a tissue homeostasis perspective in the knee and other joints, and that is clinically silent joint normal bone scan, and a Rosenberg x-ray. If you can achieve these three things, it doesn't make any difference what other factors are present. It doesn't make any difference what the MRI says. And this is going to drive the MRI guys nuts uh, when this is published, for sure. Uh, but uh, this is true and from our experience. Number one, total clinical silence. This is the subjective indicator of a joint that's in full homeostasis. Not just pain-free, but indistinguishable from an uninjured knee. Any instability, soreness, stiffness doesn't apply. No normal bone scan. Now, this is the objective metabolic indicator of a joint that's in full homeostasis. It rules out active OA, but it's, by itself, it's not that critical because you can still have pain from, say, a saphenous nerve impingement. So by itself, it, it's not that uh, critical. And, and a normal Rosenberg x-ray, which is this bent knee uh, film, it's more sensitive than the standard AP x-ray of a, of a kelgren lawrence scale, but we still grade it with a kelgren lawrence scale. Uh, is the objective structural indicator of a joint that's full homeostasis long term. But it, by itself, it's, you could still have a positive bone scan. But if you put them all together, you put them all together in the same patient, total clinical silence, normal bone scan, normal x-ray. As I stand before you, I am one of these people. This is success from a tissue homeostasis perspective. This is functional, a metabolically happy knee without OA for decades, we hope. Therefore, it does not matter if an ACL is, is not, quote, the anatomic, because my ACL reconstructions are not anatomic. 
They are not a double bundle, but you don't need double bundle. That's the point. In fact, uh, the double bundle technique is showing early arthritic changes that are worse. They're 20% failures of two years. You don't need a double bundle. You don't need, meta you don't need anatomic because the knee is metabolically forgiving. Uh, the principle, achieve and maintain tissue and joint homeostasis is with its associated pain-free function. To me, all extant factors of any joint, in, in the knee in this case, height, weight, sex, age, nutrition, activity level, alignment, etc., are summated at the level of tissue homeostasis or non-homeostasis. It's the final common pathway that's critical in joint function. And you could have any one of these that's abnormal, one or the other, but in summary, if they all equal uh, joint homeostasis, now you've got something. Now the concept of the, the knee is kind of like a biologic transmission, and every transmission has a torque envelope, so does the knee. We call this the envelope of function. It's a load frequency distribution that defines a safe range of loading for a given knee or joint system. It, every joint has this. And it's a zone of tissue homeostasis that's inductive of homeostasis. And it turns out there are four zones of uh, differential loading that joints respond to. Disuse, homeostasis, overuse, and structural failure. Now the goal of orthopedic treatment is to me maximize the envelope of function as safely and as predictably as possible. And I think this is the goal for all joints. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? It's a wonderful presentation. The pre in show very much. The question I have is uh, the bone scan. Is that equivalent to bone marrow edema shown in the MRI study? Is there any comparison with that? Thank, thank you for that question. Um, it's much more, by the time you see bone marrow edema, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak. The bone marrow edema is a late change. We're picking the same process up early. What we're showing in our cases here, as I showed you, the MRI signals are normal. Bone marrow edema is a late change. Um, uh, uh, osteoarthritis of the knee is a spectrum. It's a trajectory. We're picking up what we're showing. What I'm showing you here this morning is picking up this loss of, os of, of homeostasis at a time before there's edema, at a time before there's edema. By the time you see edema on an MRI, uh, it's kind of the horses out of the bar barn, so to speak. Uh, and every time there's edema, the bone scan will certainly be positive. But this, the bone scan is so sensitive, it picks it up at a time before there's edema. So uh, when I see these um, uh, studies that talk about edema, and then there's now treatment about you know, doing the subchondroplasty and so forth, treating uh, knees that have edema, that, that, that is a failure of treatment or failure of picking it up early. So yes, edema is that same process, but un, uh, not treated properly. It's, it's gotten out of hand, in my opinion. We have a question up here from the panel. Thanks, Dr. Dye. Yeah, in my own knee, I, I remember I used to ski with the US ski team, and many years ago I had undiagnosed ACL, and, and one of the docs, um, I had subluxation events. And after one subluxation event, put me in a cast, actually two weeks in a full cast, and then hinged it for four. And I wonder that wasn't the best thing he could have done for me because it really rested the joint and enabled me to achieve that, that homeostasis. What are your strategies for achieving tissue homeostasis when you have a, an acute patient, a newly injured patient? A, a, acute ACL injury, for yes. example? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, or meniscal tear, too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I, uh, first of all, I explain to the patient these concepts. Because they've heard, they go to the you know, internet these days, and they figure, well, you got to have surgery immediately, mm -hmm. and all this stuff. And they're, they're brainwashed uh, into this structural and kinematic paradigm as well. So I, I take, take the time to explain these concepts. I give them some of my work to, uh, to, to read. And I said, what we need to do, your, your knee has had a major injury. An ACL injury is a major injury. Um, uh, a, uh, the typical injury like an acute ACL injury will be a subluxing lateral injury that has a bone bruise of the posterior lateral tibia plateau and the anterior lateral femoral condyle. In fact, it's so uh, typical, it's pathognomonic for that injury. I can tell by looking at the MRI what happened. And that, that's a bone bruise that's, that's a pretty, pretty significant injury. And I say to the patient, this knee has had a substantial uh, traumatic uh, event. It needs time to heal. Uh, you, oftentimes you'll have an effusion for a variety of reasons. The muscles get atrophic and so forth. So we need to let 400 million years of vertebrate evolution uh, do its work to kind of bring your knee back to 
the healing or to some degree of homeostasis. We need to let the fluid uh, be reabsorbed. We need to let uh, the range of motion come back in. And we need a very safe and careful physical therapy program, not an aggressive one. We talked about this aggressive, you know, accelerated rehab. I'm very, very much against this now. And, and in fact, currently, finally, People in my, in my field are, are realizing that that's, a, that's, that's, that's an incorrect thing to do and that the uh, high rates of arthritis are following. So even now, um, this guy named Tim Hewitt from uh, Ohio State University was pushing this. Now he's, now he's back, I'd say 18 months it takes to heal up fully. He's now talking about 24 months. Everybody's backing off. So if you give uh, that patient's DNA encoded mechanisms of healing, all this complexity, we're seeing you know, bits of it here, uh, it's beyond comprehension how mm -hmm. complex it is, but it's built in to every person's DNA code. If we just let um, that process proceed without subversion, and as the envelope of function, uh, the envelope is diminished immediately, and then we let it expand, and then at say three, four months out, and we've uh, you've gone through careful rehab, and, and a lot of people can gain functional stability in an ACL injured knee, even though the ACL doesn't heal itself very well. If you sequentially fire your muscles just in the proper way, and the muscles are like the molecular engines. In in this analogy, you have millions of cylinders. If they fire them in the right sequence, if you have a good cerebellum, you can do this. And then uh, oftentimes uh, that's broad enough and you don't have to have a reconstruction. I, I operate in less than 50% of my own AC ACL injuries. Mm -hmm. Another question from the panel. Uh, hi, Dr. Dye, thank you for a very nice presentation. I've got two questions really. One is uh, similar to what you were just talking about, your ACL reconstruction. So are you sort of advocating when you see patients with ACL injuries, would you wait for a period of conservative management and then would you get scans done to see if knees achieved hemostasis and then avoid ACL reconstruction? Obviously if they're asymptomatic, would that sort of be something you're planning on doing? <coughs> I make my decision on whether to recommend surgery or not more on the functional characteristics than the imaging ones. In, in, in fact, I use the imaging much more to, de to detect um, and determine how well whatever treatment plan we have used has worked. So if I can talk a patient, if they're doing well by that, I mean functional stability. If they've achieved functional stability, in other words, their knee isn't giving out with normal activities, and I can talk them into bicycling, which is a great way to rehab a knee. It's well within their envelope, typically. And I can talk them out of going back to high pivoting sports, which is dangerous. Even for ACL reconstructed knee, high-end soccer can, can damage them. It's out of their envelope. They can't do it safely. So. I will, talk, um, if I can talk them into doing uh, a non-operative uh, procedure, I mean, non-operative course of therapy, and they're doing fine, I won't image them until 18 months. 18 months is a time frame for me. But if, um, um, if they choose surgery, I, I won't re-image them at that point. I'll wait till 18 months following the surgery, and I'll image them then. And what I image them is Rosenberg X-ray and an MRI. I really don't care, I mean, excuse me, Rose, sorry, Rosenberg X-ray and a bone scan, sorry. Uh, I don't think the MRI is critical. And um, like I said, I think I'm gonna be uh, chased by the MRI guys horribly once I publish this stuff. But I don't think it's critical. And I showed you my own T1 row, it's horribly abnormal. And the, and the, the, the uh, the cartilage research guys that are looking at early arthritis are, are saying, gee, that's the, go the golden uh, uh, canary in the mine shaft. And I don't think it is. Because I think in my case, I have normal age-related chondromalacia that anybody in my age group, I'm 65, has. You take 65-year-olds, and a lot of them will have uh, asymptomatic chondromalacia and abnormal T1 rows. Excellent. Thanks for that. Sorry, just to extend on to that second bit of the oh, question. Yeah, sure. Have you ever looked into um, hemostasis in other elements of uh, knee surgery, such as overall improving joint alignment with osteotomies, oh, yes. or even meniscal transplant surgeries with you know, people who've lost subtotal meniscectomies and things like that? Yeah, excellent question. That's a great way to follow those things. Um, uh, uh, there's a guy named uh, Spike Erasmus in South Africa who presented this very topic at the ESCA meeting in Europe a few years ago. And what he's looking at is, what he did was a very interesting study. He did a um, <clears throat> bone scan study preoperatively one year and three years in a high tibial osteotomy yeah. model. And so what he found was is that w all of them got into the study by having an abnormal bone scan in medial compartment only. At one year, the medial compartment activity dr dramatically decreased, as you would predict, as the model, the homeostasis model predicted. But the lateral compartment picked up activity as you would also predict. But the most interesting thing about this study, in my opinion, was at three years, this abnormal lateral activity that uh, showed at the one year uh, adapted and came back to normal. In other words, the knee metabolically adapted to that lateral activity. Yeah. So to me, that was a very interesting metabolic insight yeah. into how the knee adapted to that high tibial osteotomy, just, that, just yeah, like you yeah, talked yeah. about. Excellent, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Dai.